Good day, Andrew Whitney here, and I thought I might share with you a look at this vintage 1957 Leica 3G film camera. Now I can't say anything about this camera without giving a bit of a backstory first, because like several other still photographic cameras of its era, like the twin lens Rolleiflex, the Hasselblad, the Nikon F, this camera, or rather the line of cameras that it comes from, has some important historical significance in the development of still film cameras, film photography, and the photographers who used them. This camera is the last model made in a line of Leicas called the Barnack Leicas, named after their inventor Oscar Barnack, a German fine mechanic and amateur photographer who worked for the Optical Mechanical Company of Ernst Leitz of Wetzlar, Germany in the early 1900s. At this time, still photographs were typically taken using large stand cameras, which used whole sheets of film or glass plates to shoot single images. Oscar Barnack was also a keen mountaineer, and he didn't like lugging such a large camera kit around with him on his mountain hikes. And he had the idea of creating a miniature camera, which used a short, rolled up, five foot length of 35 millimeter wide motion picture film to expose dozens of negatives on a single strip, each exposure being 24 by 36 millimeters in size, which was double the film gate size used in motion picture cameras of the time. From this idea came Barnack's first Leica camera, the Model 1, released by Lights in 1925, and it was fitted with a fixed 50 millimeter f3.5 Lights LMAX lens specially designed for it by another Lights employee, the lens designer Max Berick. Because of its diminutive size, the new Leica was at first not taken very seriously. But then innovative, fast-working photographers like Henry Cartier-Bresson and Alfred Eisenstadt got hold of it, and using this fast, miniature, highly portable camera, a new type of candid reportage photography was born, and it made the Leica camera, its new proponents, and the new 35mm film format popular and successful. And it's still a popular camera format today in digital cameras, such as this Leica M Type 240, which shoots both still photographs and videos onto a 24 by 36 mm digital sensor. Over the years, various features were added to the successive Barnack models. Adding things like viewfinders, interchangeable lenses, an internal focusing rangefinder, a broader range of shutter speeds, flash synchronisation, a self-timer, and finally a precision brightline finder with parallax correction. This 3G was the last Barnack model made, before the line was discontinued in 1960, and it's the most advanced of them all. After this camera, lights continued on with their very successful new Leica M3 and M2 cameras, which provided a similar functionality in a sleeker, more modern design. So let's look at this vintage film camera in detail. First of all, it's compact and relatively lightweight, at a little over 700 grams, as you see it here. Fitted with a lens, a lens shade, and a neck strap, and loaded with film and ready to shoot. It was invented as a miniature camera, and it still seems miniature today, with its very detailed and ornate styling. It's smaller and lighter than most other well-featured 35mm film and digital cameras, and with its collapsible lens, it wears unobtrusively beneath a jacket, and it fits easily into a pocket or pouch. It has about the same back footprint as my iPhone 7, and the two carry well together, as I use a light metering app in the iPhone together with it. In common with all Barnack Leicas, this camera is entirely mechanical, and it doesn't have a light meter or take any kind of battery. And here's the camera in its very compact and usable leather EverReady case, which secures to it using the tripod thread that's recessed into the base plate. 
The distinctive rounded ends of this camera are shaped around the 35mm film canister at one end and a corresponding empty film take-up chamber at the other end. The camera's very solid metal parts are finished in the most superb satin finish chrome and the body is clad in black vulcanised rubber, a hard leather grained finish. Here's the everlasting self-opening film canister which lights made for it, for use in bulk loading your own film. When inserted into the camera and the base plate is closed and locked, the mouth of the canister opens up to provide free travel for the film without the use of a felt light trap. The camera also takes regular factory packed films too. So what's the 3G like to use? Let's use it. First, to load it, you need to trim your film leader to a long sloping shape like this, and then push its end under a spring clip on the camera's detachable film take-up spindle. Then you insert the whole thing up into the camera from underneath, as shown in the loading diagram printed inside the base of the camera. Next, I replace the base plate and lock it and then wind on and fire off a few blank frames in order to bring fresh film out from the film canister into the starting position at the film gate. Now I can set the exposure counting dial which surrounds the advance knob to 1 and I'm ready to take my first shot. I can also set the film type reminder dial embedded in the back of the camera to remind myself of which type of film I've loaded. Note the very neat engravings on this camera. I find I can read them without having to wear my reading glasses. Now my next step might be to take an exposure reading of my subject or scene and to then set the shutter speed and aperture here at the camera. Unusually, this camera has two shutter speed dials. One for the faster speeds between a thirtieth of a second and a thousandth of a second, located here on top of the camera and the other for the slower speeds between a thirtieth of a second and one second located here at the front of the camera. The top mounted fast shutter speed setting dial is unusual in that it rotates as you advance the film using the film winding knob as it tensions the shutter drum spring located beneath it. Then when you press the shutter button to take the photo the dial spins back again the other way back to its starting position. The dial only makes sense to look at and set when it's in the wound up tensioned position with the film advanced and the shutter ready to fire. So a glance at this dial tells you whether the camera is ready to shoot or whether you need to advance it first. The fast shutter speed dial features settings for use with electric flash and it also has a B or brief setting which makes the shutter stay open for as long as your finger or cable release remains depressed on the shutter release button. To set this dial to a 60th of a second, I need to lift it and turn it and then settle it down in a marked notched position. I can't use an intermediate setting. The front mounted slow shutter speed setting dial is also unusual. With this slow speed dial, I can set any marked or intermediate speed and the dial also features an unusual T or time setting which makes the shutter stay open permanently until I close it again by moving the dial away from the T position. This makes this camera handy for taking night shots and other long exposure photographs without the need for a locking cable release. Next to the slow shutter speed setting dial is a self timer which provides a 10 second spring tension delay before the shutter fires. It can be used with all timed shutter speeds and with electronic flash and with the long duration T setting. Now where were we? I was going to set an aperture of f4 at the lens. Let's look at this standard 50mm f2.8 Lights Elmar lens introduced in 1957 together with this camera. It collapses into the body for more compact storage and carrying, so I need to pull it out and twist it into a locked extended position to ensure that my pictures will be correctly focused. Now I can set my lens aperture and I can also set my focus using the distance markings engraved on the barrel 
or by using the internal rangefinder, which I'll show you in a moment. This lens focuses from infinity down to one meter, using just a half rotation of the lens barrel, and its closest view covers approximately 40 by 60 centimeters, which works well for a half-length portrait. With a maximum speed of f2.8, this is a sharp, reasonably fast lens of normal field of view, so it's neither wide nor telephoto, and it uses the same E39 size filters and clip-on Leica lens hoods as today's more modern Leica lenses. What about focusing and composing the photo? At the back of the camera there's a twin eyepiece, the left-hand peephole, shows you a rangefinder focusing view of your subject. It shows two sharp images of your subject out of register. To focus the lens critically on the subject, you rotate the lens barrel to make the two images overlap and merge into one, and at this point the subject will be sharply focused on the film. An adjustment lever beneath the rewind knob sharpens this focusing system to optimally suit your eyesight. The right hand peephole shows you a sharp view of your overall picture. It shows you an outer silver frame for use with this standard 50mm lens and four inner corners for use with an alternative longer focal length narrower 90mm lens. As I focus the lens closer the frame moves down to thus maintain an accurate view of the scene as seen by the lens. This automatic adjustment is called parallax correction. The lens can be unscrewed from the camera and replaced with a different one, of a different speed, or which takes in a different field of view. And if it's a lens of other than 50 or 90 mm focal length, then I need to fit a corresponding accessory viewfinder into the accessory holding shoe in order to see what the lens sees, and so be able to compose my photo correctly. The accessory shoe is the same size as the one used on today's more modern cameras, so this camera will accept and hold all old and new electronic flash and viewfinder accessories. Now to take the photo. The shutter button is surrounded by a removable collar, which guards against accidental exposure and it takes a special shroud fitting cable release. And it's easy to photograph with this camera at low shutter speeds, handheld, without jarring the camera. Having taken the shot, I now only need to advance the film advance knob until it automatically stops at the next frame and I'm ready to shoot again. Now when the film is fully used up and it won't advance any further, and it's time to rewind it into its canister and remove it from the camera for processing, I move the advanced rewind lever to the R or rewind position. This locks down the shutter button and locks the advance knob, and I can now pull up the rewind knob and turn it in the direction of its engraved arrow to rewind the film back into its canister. On this camera, the little black beauty spot engraved on the shutter release button rotates fully each time a frame of film moves past it in either direction. And so when it stops rotating during rewinding, it means that the film leader is now passed to the left hand side of it. And I can now open the base plate and remove the film canister with the tongue still protruding from it, which is useful if I'm doing my own processing. And in this case, I'll fold the film leader over a few times as an indication that the film has been exposed, so that I don't accidentally reload it and shoot it again. To load a new film, I move the advanced rewind lever back to the advanced position, which then unlocks the advance knob and the shutter release button, and allows me to advance a new film through the camera. I use my Leica 3G camera with 400 speed black and white negative film and I process and print it myself in a traditional and larger equipped darkroom. I find that with this camera I get sharp pictures with excellent tonality and that the lens covers the film evenly from corner to corner without illumination fall off and without image or shape distortion. In summary, 
This is a compact, ornately designed film camera, which is highly mechanical in its nature and use. It's a bit of a conversation piece, and it clearly isn't a digital camera. It's fun to use, and if you go all the way in developing and printing its negatives in a darkroom, then it will get you well away from the computer, and will provide you with enlarged, very high quality prints, which can look great pinned to your wall, instead of floating around in cyberspace, on an endless digital scroll. Like most rangefinder cameras, it's incapable of producing tight close-ups, unless you modify it with an accessory such as this Visiflex, which turns it into a crude but very workable SLR. And there it is, with its very precise construction, high quality interchangeable lenses, rangefinder focusing, high quality parallax corrected viewing window, wide range of shutter speeds, flash synchronization, and a self timer. This is a professional grade vintage film camera in the 1950s style. See you next time.